Uh, welcome to the 2009 Smithfield uh, Lecture Series. We are doing a cemetery tour today. We are starting at stop number one, which is Preston Cemetery. It's on the grounds of historic Smithfield Plantation. Inside the cemetery, there are numerous historic folks that people in uh, Virginia are unaware are actually buried right in their backyard. I want to start by just talking a little bit about the cemetery itself. Uh, we will probably show here in just a second a thing around the outside of the cemetery, which is called a ha-ha. That is a rather unique trench slash fence that was a, of English and Irish descent, and the nobles would use it prior to uh, having fence laws. And what it does, it's a little trench, and it keeps the cattle and the roaming um, sheep out of the cemetery. Uh, the Prestons, of course, being from a rather prestigious family, they were Irish, when they came over, they brought some of their old world traditions with them, and the ha-ha is a representation of that tradition. Inside the actual graveyard, we have William Preston, founder of Smithfield. There's four vaults within the cemetery, and the cemetery vaults are unique because what they do is they have the husband and the wife stacked on top of each other in these vaults. But of course, William Preston is the first one that would be in here. He was Colonel William Preston of the Revolutionary War, and like I said, was the founder of Smithfield. And his wife is also listed with him. Another soldier that is here is James Pres Patton Preston, excuse me. He was, um, in addition to being a soldier, he was the governor of Virginia from 1816 to 1819. There is no actual stone in this graveyard listing his burial. However, tradition says that he was buried here, and there was um, an oral recording of it that said that when they brought him and buried him, they just uncovered a little bit of the periwinkle, which is the ground cover in the cemetery, placed him in and recovered it, but never actually officially marked it, which is unfortunate being a governor of Virginia and us not having an official marker, but we know he is buried in this cemetery. A few other interesting folks that are in here is William Ballard Preston. He was a Virginia representative and a state senator. He's also secretary of the Navy and a Virginia state constitution um, member. He also was with the Confederate government and was in the Confederate Congress. He owned 48 slaves and he inherited the part of the farm after William Preston. James Francis Preston is the next one. And he was a captain during the Mexican War. He was also a state legislator. He was a colonel of the 4th Virginia Infantry during the Civil War. He was wounded at the Battle of First Manassas, or called Bull Run, as some folks call it. He died from effects of battle wounds that he received during that battle, came home to Smithfield, and a year later, with the lingering effects of the battle wounds, did pass away. He is married to Sarah Carpenter of Whitethorn, and she is also buried on top of him, just like the other ones that we were talking about. The, the two, the, the husband and wife, were just buried on top of each other, stacked in. Another interesting person that's buried here is uh, Robert Taylor Preston. He's the son of James Patton. He was a lieutenant colonel for the 4th Virginia Reserves and also a colonel of the 25th Virginia Infantry during the Civil War. He was also um, what they considered a colonel of the, the reserves under Colonel Wade out of Christiansburg, but he was, when they called out Wade's brigade or Preston's brigade, it was uh, Robert Taylor's brigade that came out. He did a lot of the, um, the local defense late in the war during the Saltville campaign and during the um, Battle of Cloyd's Mountain. Also with him is James Patton Preston, again another offspring of the other ones. He was with the 4th Virginia Infantry and the 14th Virginia Cav. Waller Reed Preston, son of Ballard again, was a major in the 14th Virginia Infantry, oh sorry, 14th Virginia Cavalry, and the 4th Virginia Infantry. He was appointed captain for John, General John Eccles' staff and he was on that staff until the end of the war. He attended UVA. Later on after the war, he moved to Texas and died a mysterious murder death in Texas and was shipped back home to Smithfield and buried here. No one knows exactly quite what happened with the murder. Robert Starks Meade was a son-in-law to Robert Taylor Preston and he was a major, a lieutenant, a major and then a lieutenant colonel of the 17th South Carolina Infantry and he married into the family. The other interesting plot within the same family is the Ledgerwood plot, and it's going to be towards the back of the cemetery here. And that one was um, the overseers for Smithfield. 
Anderson Ledger Wood was the overseer and his family and his uh, wife are, are buried in this back area here. He uh, was drafted into the Confederate Army, but since he was an overseer, he was exempted and therefore stayed in this area and acted as the male protector for, this, for the family here and for the local community in the Blacksburg. Uh, the last really unique person that's buried in here is Aunt Jenny Cappers. She was an ex-slave. She was a child rearer for the, the family itself after the war. And she is buried with the family in their plot. Her marker is it's marked by stones and actually got a headstone. But that's a very unique, a unique, a unique thing that you see in the southwest Virginia is the slaves being buried or the ex-slaves being buried with their family. However, on our tour, we're going to see it happen twice. But she was very, very, very well respected and loved by her family. And she was the quintessential historian for the Prestons and the Ledgerwoods and everything, oral history that got passed down. She was the keeper of those records. And thankfully, she is one of the ones that left us a lot of information about this, uh, this cemetery. Before we go and look at the stones, one last thing we're going to look at too is the trees that are in here and a little bit of the vegetation. This ground cover is periwinkle. Periwinkle was used in graves to cover it up afterwards and it would be a quick ground cover and it would pretty much keep the ground from eroding after the, the graves were run. And they have a little blue flower on them, blues in the early spring and it's really pretty and you can see it in any old graveyard, you know, for 100% fact, if you think there's a graveyard, there's no stones, but you see a lot of periwinkle, it's a pretty good indicator there really was a graveyard there. In addition, some of the big old trees that are around here are the original trees. Uh, we believe this oak behind us is an original tree, and this red oak, the one right here that's dying a tragic death, is uh, one of the original trees. Welcome to stop number two, St. Michael's Lutheran Church. Behind me is a monument to the site of the first original St. Michael's Church. As indicated by the monument behind me during the uh, late 17, or early 1700s, Germans were being persecuted in Germany and a whole lot of them chose to come to the New World to get away from that persecution. What they did was come in to, through Philadelphia and get on the Great Valley Road and head west and south and a lot of them end up in this general area of Montgomery County on Horseshoe Bottom which is the two where the river has two loops in it. They first settled there and they moved up to this area in the mid 1700s. They were promised an allotment of land by James Patton who had one of the largest land grants west of the Alleghenies. He said that he was going to give them some land for their first church which is normal for any group that's running away. They want The first thing they want to do is have somewhere where they can come and socialize and get back to some normalcy. So a church was that first step to normalcy again. James Patton, however, was killed in 1755 at the Draper's Massacre on what is now the Virginia Tech campus. So there was a little bit of time after that that all the Germans who were promised the land didn't want to just take the land that they were promised, so they held out for a little while. And then later on, they went ahead and decided to build the first church, which was called St. Michael's, and it was on this property. It remained St. Michael's until after the American Revolution. During that time, they reorganized and decided to call it St. Peter's, and uh, this as a reference to the St. Peter's name. They stayed here as a, a church through the 1800s into the, uh, the turn of the century. And several churches split off and they became Mount Tabor and Mount Zion in the Blacksburg area. And then later on they rebuilt here. And several other Lutheran churches pulled the congregation away. The church itself got to be a little older. And they finally decided to move and build a new St. Peter's Church over on Glade Road as you're going into Blacksburg. That ran for a while as a church until this century. About 1971, several of the churches got back together, decided that they would like to recreate what was originally here, which was St. Michael's, and they built a new church on that land once again and rechristened it as its original name. The church behind me is christened Cornerstone 1971. However, over to the right of the church is the original cemetery, and that will be our next stop. I'm going to show you just a, a few of the uh, the stones that are still visible there and tell a little bit of the little history of them. We are in the graveyard of St. Michael's Lutheran Church, one of the oldest Lutheran churches in west of the Allegheny Mountains. Behind me is the grave of David Scandlin. He is a unique individual. Germans 
for the most part, were sort of pacifists, didn't want to get involved in the wars. But this young, well, I don't want to say young man, this fellow behind me during the American Civil War was patriotic enough to want to serve. However, at the age of 45, he didn't feel like, you know, getting too involved in it, wanted to continue his pacifist ways. So he enlisted with the 4th Virginia Infantry, which was Stonewall's brigade. Um, he enlisted as a drummer. He was probably one of the oldest drummer boys in the whole Confederate Army. He was also so good at his job that he was assigned to be the regimental musician for the entire regiment. During one of the battles, the only time he ever had to do anything Moorish at all was he had to guard a baggage train at one of the battles, never actually even had to pick up a gun. So he served his entire existence as a musician. Shortly thereafter when he came home, unfortunately he did pass away rather quickly after the war. So it probably wasn't the most healthy thing for him to do. However, his service was appreciated and he was, like I said, given a high rank as a musician. The next stone here is Joseph Snyder. He is interesting for several reasons. First and foremost, one of the designs on his tombstones are very unique and unique but very similar for German style tombs. They have what they have is a little tiny heart that is bordering the entire slate stone there. And you'll see that a lot in this area just from the German influence, but you won't see it in many pl other places. Uh, also unique about him, I did a, a census search for him. And this young man was a wagoneer, and he worked at Price's shop up the next stop that we're going to hit. And he was a blacksmith, and this, the wagoner worked for the blacksmith shop up, up, up the road just the ways there. The graveyard here has several markers that are still visible. However, at one point in time, this whole entire graveyard was full. There has been attempts throughout the years to or locate some of the original graves and put new markers on them. And for this particular person, this is one that has been marked more recently. This is John W. Price, and he was a member of the 36th Virginia Infantry out of Blacksburg. Right. And the stone behind me is another one of the ones that we don't exactly know who it belongs to, but it is kind of representative of how old this actual yard is. And you can see how the tree itself is kind of taken over and encapsulating the stone. And that's just one of those uh, pretty little things that you catch in some graveyards that makes it very unique and hopefully everybody can appreciate that. All right, welcome to stop number three. This is the Wall Cemetery, directly adjacent to the Evans Cemetery. What is very unique about this, from stop number two, there was the monument that had all the founders, all the German founders, and it listed John Michael Price on there, and it listed the walls. We are in the family cemeteries for this one now. John Michael Price, of course, is the predecessor to where Price's Fork gets its name. He came over from Germany in that first evacuation of the, the prosecution Germans that were fleeing Germany or fleeing Europe. And he came over on a ship called the Winter Galley and he brought with him his family, his brothers, and his brother's, brother's sister and the wife. And uh, there was a, the Harlesses also came with them. And our last stop this afternoon is going to be the Harless Cemetery. And Philip Harless was the fellow that joined when they came over to, to begin with. John Michael Price was in the Revolution. He fought for the American side, of course, and he was with Captain Taylor's militia, Virginia militia, that was formed from this area, and he was promoted to a corporal. And afterwards, he, of course, stayed here in this area and developed the community that's named for him. And we'll get a shot of his um, stone here in just a few minutes. It does have the American Revolu Daughters of the American Revolution marker on it. It was, as I said, the original Price land. There, shortly after, this area of the farm and was sold to Adam Wall, and he was one of the originals that came over also. And it became the Wall Cemetery shortly thereafter. And the cemetery behind us, of course, fenced off, is the Wall Cemetery. It has Adam Wall, the progenitor of that family, in there. It also has um, Adam Floyd Wall, which would be third generation Wall. He was a very large farmer during the Civil War era, and he had, at the time in 1860 from that census, he had 10 slaves, and then he also had about $10,000 in real estate and property, so he was a very, very large farmer. The cemetery that I'm standing in now is the Evans Cemetery, which is his neighbor over back on the Price's Fork Road on the opposite side. His 
land value, of course, was a whole lot less. It was just kind of nice that they put their cemeteries together. Also in the cemetery, the Wall Cemetery, is a fella named Sam Wall. He takes the last name. But Sam Wall was a seven-foot-tall African chieftain that became the overseer for the Wall Plantation. And he was so well respected and so loved by his family that he gets included in his cemetery too. I mentioned at the Preston Cemetery that um, Aunt Jenny was in the same cemetery, but Mr. Sam Wall was also as well loved and included in that. And that's a very unique situation again and very nice to see. Um, one last person of note I want to point out in the Wall Cemetery was Robert Alexander Wall. He was one of the, per the first professors of the College of Education at what became Virginia Tech and his stone is also in there. This family cemetery is still in the Wall family and a Rick Wall owns the land that the cemetery still sits on and that's also a nice touch to be able to still be able to see a wall and know where they actually came from. Welcome to stop number four. At this stop we're on what was originally called Buchanan Bottoms. It was the home of James Randall Kent at this stop, we are going to, first we're here in the family cemetery, the Kent Family Cemetery, and we're also going to go to the Slave Cemetery on the way out. But first and foremost, the Kent Family is what we got here. The original Kent Family was, of course, Joseph, James Randall Kent's. He built Kentland, which is the house down here on the outside of the horseshoe of the New River. Uh, James Randall was a, was a, a colonel. He was in the War of 1812, and he was also enlisted with the 4th Virginia Militia in the Civil War, but he was rather old at that time and therefore didn't serve as much. Uh, the first person buried in, this, buried in the cemetery was James Randall's wife, Mary Kent, and she was the daughter of General Gordon Kent, and he, that was the granddaughter of the Cloyds from Pulaski County and her stone is going to be behind us here. We'll get to her in just a few minutes. Another one of the important stones here, when everybody pulls up to the cemetery, the first thing they see is the angel behind me. And the angel behind me is Elizabeth Cloyd Kent. She was the daughter of James Randall and Mary, Clint, Mary Kent, and she was never married. Um, she, I think, not historically been able to back this up, but I think she may have been special because she never married and was so, so very, very, very loved by her family. When we sh uh, shoot the stone, it's going to have her initials and a little icon. It's going to have the E, C, and the K. That same icon that's on her tombstone is also in her house. On the second floor, her, house, her um, room was upstairs, and the doorknob had the exact same little symbol, which was really neat. So she was obviously doted on, so that's kind of where I get the idea that maybe she was just a, either special or slow, but she was definitely a spinster and never married. Another one of the important people in this is Cynthia Kent Bentley. She uh, was married to uh, John Cowan, and John Cowan was with the uh, 25th Virginia Infantry during the Civil War. And Thomas Cowan, after the war, inherits this farm, and he was the last true owner. He was a very important man, too, and his stone is down here in front of us. And after the war, like I said, he was a colonel or a major during it, so he was rather important then, and he was uh, captured and spent most of the war as a prisoner of war after the Battle of Rich Mountain in 1861, one of the first battles through the West, what became West Virginia. But afterwards, he uh, founded a railroad, and the railroad was the New River Railroad and Coal Company, and had a railroad stop at Whitethorn Landing, which is also on this farm. And he is also very much credited with being on the Board of Visitors, one of the first Board of Visitors for what became Virginia Tech. He was very wealthy and got rather crotchety in his old age, and as family legend goes, he died in the Kentland house in the downstairs office room, and we've uh, heard a couple different pe people talk about the local history, and they say that John Thomas Cowan still haunts the place, so just throwing that out there. Not historically accurate, but everybody likes that little ghost story. The wall from the cemetery, I have found evidence that it was originally built by the slaves in 1858, and it was built by limestone from Price's Mountain Lime, lime Kill up on the hill, which was on the Kentland property at the time. Later on, after the turn of the century, the last remaining Kent descendant had the wall rebuilt by local craftsmen, and they redid the stone, but everything else was the original, and the Big beautiful stones behind me were made of Italian marble and they were shipped in and they were brought down the James River and they were first 
drawn in by horses. And then after Thomas Cowan had the railroad built to his property, they shipped them down to James, put them on the, the railroad, and sent them in and handled, had them hand delivered right to the plantation. Welcome to the second part of stop number four at Buchanan Bottoms, Kentland Farms. This area is where they have found the slave cemeteries. The Kent farm ran with several slaves during the, the entire time that it was here. In 1850, they had 83 slaves. In 1860, they recorded 103 slaves. During the 1864 federal invasion and the Battle of Cloyd's Mountain, the Union Army retreated across the river and through this area and encamped on this farm. During that time frame, the slaves that were still here on the farm left with the Union Army. 52 of them left. Five of them came back. After the war, the area of Wake Forest, which is down process work just a little bit further, became a community founded on the ex-slaves. And the marker here dedicates the slave graves that were originally on the plantation. Behind us is the marker, the actual location of the slave cemetery, which is marked by that cross. They have excavated 13 graves, and Tom Clacka with the Virginia Department of Archaeology has had the, the dig performed and has found the 13. Each of the dogwood trees planted behind me represent each of the graves that they have found. An interesting story, during the invasion, when the, the Union Army was encamped here, the slaves got a little joyful. They knew that freedom was coming. And they went and got into the barn of James Randall Kent. And James Randall Kent had an old grandiose carriage from like the Washingtonian days. And they all got it out. And there were, like I said, at least 52 that were involved in this maneuver. They got it out. They hooked up the mules to it. They raided the, uh, the Kent plantation, got all the fineries. They all dressed up. They had their absolute finest dresses on. They all crammed into this carriage. And when the Union Army did leave, that was exactly how they followed which gives you a, a rather interesting picture of uh, the jovelty of freedom coming and how happy they were to do it. Welcome to stop number five and the final stop on our tour. This is the David Harless Cemetery. It's located in Longshop. It's named after David Harless, who was one of the original Germans that moved into this area. His stone, however, is not in the graveyard. We do know, however, that he was buried here, and he died in 1817. So that's why it's named after him. Another name that was going to be familiar, we've already talked about it once, was Philip Harless. And his stone is directly behind me here. He was, a, of course, in the Revolutionary War. I already mentioned that. He was with Captain Taylor's militia. But he also has a record and a land grant from the French and Indian War. So I think some of this original land was from that original land grant that he won prior to the Revolution. The uh, Harless community itself and the families that grew out of it were very patriotic and they did, many of them, fight during the uh, Civil War. And so a few of the ones that we're going to point out here in a few minutes were Daniel Harless. He fought with the 50th Virginia Infantry and he also re-enlisted with the 54th Virginia Infantry and later on just kind of came on home. He got tired of fighting and was listed as a deserter. Another one that's listed was Anthony Harless. He was with the 59th Virginia Infantry. Uh, likewise, Flager Jackson Harless was with the 4th Virginia Reserves. So that was a later forming unit that formed after the invasion in the 1864 time period. And he showed up for duty, got his $50 conscript, and then just ran away too. So even though they were patriotic, they weren't uh, the most follow-through folks, I guess is how we'll say it. John M. Albert, who was also in this community during the war, is an interesting fellow. He enlisted with the 36th Virginia Infantry. And uh, he was with that unit, fought a few battles, fought the Battle of Paris or Princeton. And then they realized that the New River, which was ran by the Confederacy and had a whole bunch of ferries going up and down it and crossing the treacherous waters that we all know down at McCoy Falls, they realized they needed someone who was local and who knew the river well enough that they could help with the navigation of the, the boats. So they uh, sent Mr. Uh, Albert home and said, I want you to stay in the community and I want you to run those boats across. So the rest of the war he was listed as a boatman and helped ferry the, uh, the munitions and the troops across, which was nice for him. He got to stay home and got to serve. 
Uh, another person that we're going to look at in a few minutes is Floyd P. Long. He's with the 36th Virginia Infantry. And he is the one that gives this absolute community right here its name. He was a, a blacksmith. Therefore, Floyd Long, Long Shop is where he gets the name for this. Epron Long was a cousin of his, and he fought with the 11th Virginia Infantry, which was uh, mustered out of Dublin. George Graves was another one, and he was with the 36th Virginia Infantry also. He, uh, he's the only one that we actually know what looked like from the service records. Well, once he en enlisted, he was taken prisoner at the Battle of Waynesboro, which happened late in the war. And when they ran him in, they, they listed what he looked like. So we know that he was five feet tall. He had blue eyes and dark hair, and he was one of the bigger farmers in this area, and we believe that his land went that direction. Uh, another one just to mention was Alan Harless. He never served, and I found uh, some in interesting information on him through the Southern Claims Commission. During the late 1880s, after the war, any Southerner who claimed loyalty to the Union and had their property either destroyed, taken, messed up in some way could go in front of Congress. It was an act of Congress. If you come up there, you could interrogate it. And if you could prove that you were loyal and the unions did something to your property, they would pay you. And during the 1880s, that was that first big economic crash. So everybody started needing money. So you had a lot of people that from this area and also from the Crab Creek area in Christiansburg, where the other invasion route came through, claim. But what you have to do is actually prove it. So Alan Harless went up in front of Congress and had off his friends and neighbors say how loyal he was to the Union and how he deserved to have the money and he had his horses taken away from him. So they did a big, huge investigation and found out that not only did he vote for secession, he voted for Jefferson Davis, and he also sold and made lots of money off of the Confederate States by selling horses. So his claim, along with the 39 other claims claimed through Montgomery County, were all denied. Only one solitary claim from Montgomery County was ever accepted. And I think that's one of those one of those interesting points where you hear a lot about unionism in this area. Price's Fork was a very unionistic town or unionist community and this area was. So what you hear, but if you actually go look back into the actual history of it, that unionism came in the 1880s versus actually during the war. So that's just a neat little story I'd like to tell. That actually wraps up our cemetery tour. I appreciate the time and I hope maybe next year we can do it again. Just want to say there are a lot of abandoned cemeteries out there. Today we looked at a lot of really nice well-kept ones, but there are a lot out there and if anyone wants to help, Gatekeeper Society, it will take all volunteers.